Um, this is my first Controls Con, I'll be honest. When I agreed to do this, I was picturing 100 people in a, in a uh, hotel ballroom, so this is both uh, fantastic and terrifying at the same time, but we'll get through it. So, um, glad to be here. Again, my name's Tom Benzer. I'm a business development manager for Blimo Digital Products in the Americas. Um, most of you probably know who Blimo is, but for those who don't, um, we're a global leader in the, I suppose I should advance my slides, um, global leader in the uh, design, manufacture, and sales of actuators, valves, and sensors, devices for the HVAC market. We're focused on the HVAC market. You'll hear me say that word a few times during this presentation. We're a very focused company. Uh, we're a Swiss company. We were founded in 1975, and our first product was a uh, direct-coupled actuator, which allowed you to take a motor and stick it right on a damper shaft, and it was uh, time-saving, uh, reliability enhancement that kind of changed the world of actuators. And from that point on, um, in 1977, when we created that first product, we've been kind of an industry leader, at least we feel we are, from a, from a technology and innovation standpoint. So with that said, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about technology. So I'll give you about 10 seconds. There's some, some icons and some numbers here. Maybe you can, uh, in your mind, come up with what those might represent. And if anyone knows, shout it out. Fantastic. So this is representative of the adoption rate of technology. So electric lighting or electrification of homes, the first home in the US, from the time that first happened till 25% of US households had electricity, 46 years. Um, personal computers took 16. So the first PC got into a home, and 16 years later, 25% homes had personal computers. And then smartphones only took four years. So what this represents is, you know, we're a connected world, so when a new product, new idea comes out, it's very quick compared to olden days for everybody to adopt that product. Um, and you can just kind of let your mind wander as to what, what new uh, products, what new ideas will be able to, you know, completely uh, influence our, our world in a very quick amount of time. I think it'll have something to do with conversational AI, maybe, but we'll see. Um, so this next chart, let's, so that's adoption of technology, and then we move on to development of technology. So um, these three graphs represent how computing power, data storage, and connectivity have all, um, their development, their capability has accelerated. And this is on a per dollar basis. So these are all exponential. So if we linearize them, you can see they, they have kind of a nice, uh, a nice trend. So it takes about every seven years, we end up with 10 times the computing power for the same amount of money. Every five years is uh, you know, data storage. You get 10 times the data storage every five years. So if you pay 100 bucks for a two gig, or two terabyte, see, I'm even behind, a two terabyte hard drive, you know, in, in five years it's gonna be a, a 10, 10 terabyte or a 20 terabyte drive for the same cost. And then from a connectivity standpoint, Every six years, we end up with, for about the same cost, you get 10 times the speed. So if you have a one gig connection at home, six years, it's gonna be 10 gig, and it's gonna cost you the same 59.95 or whatever that rate is. Um, I always thought there was like a, a theoretical limit to how fast you can push data through a little light pipe, a little fiber optic uh, tube. But the, the latest, I think it's 178 terabits per second is the fastest rate that someone has achieved, which is, I think, the whole Netflix catalog in under a second. So 25 years from now, if you use this math, you'll get that for $59.95. So technology is uh, really accelerating. So just to kind of illustrate what other industries have done, specifically the gaming industry with this advance in computing power, and to have a little fun, and uh, hopefully to score some points with the hometown crowd here, I want to show you a video game from when I started in this industry. This is, uh, this is NHL uh, 94. And that's, that was the best guy in the game in 94, uh, Steve Iserman. I don't know if Red Wings fans here. I'm not a, 
I'm not a big hockey fan, but he was fantastic in the game, so that's what we usually played with. So fast forward to 2023, this is what this game looks like now. I don't know if anyone's gamers have played this, but maybe it's not remarkable to you, but. Lowers the boom with that hit. Here they come on the attack. So, that's um, five times that the processing power has gone up ten times, tenfold. And, and that's what other industries have done with that. So you kind of think about what has our industry done with that, that advanced uh, processing capability and data storage and connectivity. Well, it's coming. So what is this, you know, back to the, to the real world, what does all this kind of enhancement or advancement of, of technology mean? Um, it, it, you know, it leads to the ability to have communicating devices, sensing devices that communicate at a really low cost. So theoretically, if you wanted to put a sensor on every flower in your garden, you could to help uh, optimize how it grows. Um, so we end up with a really a completely transparent world where everything is sensed, everything's recorded, um, which is kind of scary, but it ena enables us with all that data to pretty much optimize every process that this world has. So if we bring that kind of home to our, um, to our industry, you know, having a transparent building where we have just oodles and oodles of data um, is our future, and, and that's the way we optimize our buildings. So there's, there are two, we'd call them mega trends, uh, impacting our industry today. The first, uh, a socioeconomic trend, um, kind of brought on by climate change. Um, we have a need, we have a demand for improvements in energy efficiency and even net zero or carbon neutral buildings. Um, and then on the technology side, there's both a, you know, as we just saw, there's a massive movement to digitize our world and there's also huge advancements in, in compute power and connectivity. So, you know, you take those two together um, and, and you stick AI in the middle, which has all that, all that power and all this data, and that's how we can get to a point where we can have these, these net zero facilities. Um, and when you think about AI today, um, at least I do, I, I think chat GPT is extremely relevant, um, but chat GPT um, has a domain of knowledge which is the entire searchable internet. So it, at this point, it seems like kind of a fun tool. Maybe you wanna have it make a recommendation for where your family should go on a vacation from a hotel standpoint, or um, I don't know, maybe you ask it to write a limerick about how our industry adopts technology really slowly. Um, it can do things like that. That's all publicly, information, publicly available information. But now you start to think about what could I take if I have a, a unique instance of ChatGPT and I give it all the data about my building, um, construction details, um, what use cases for each of the spaces, um, HVAC systems, all of that information, and then you stream it a live stream of data from all of the sensing devices within a building, what do you think that chat GPT could tell you about? How do you optimize your building? How do you improve traffic flow? Things like that. And then if you close the loop, um, which is where it starts to get a little scary, which is what Jim pointed out earlier, um, and you make it control GPT or optimize GPT. Um, that's the future. But we, need to, we need to put some rails on that so we don't have uh, runaway buildings that are um, controlled by computers. But maybe, so maybe optimize GPT makes sense and not control GPT. Um, but, but that's definitely the future. Oops. Sorry, having clicker problems. Stop, there you go. Okay, so for, for those of you who aren't completely familiar with, your, uh, with our products, um, I just wanna run through the different types we have from a connectivity standpoint. Apologize for the chicken scratch drawings, but I'm an engineer uh, and this is kinda what I do. So, you know, I'll use a control valve as an example. Um, we have um, actuated control valves and you take a DDC controller, you send a two to 10 volt signal um, telling it what position to go to, that's 90% of what we do. 
Um, and then we also have the opportunity to make uh, communicating actuators. We do make communicating actuators. We have ones with BACnet MSTP on them. So instead of using signals directly to actuators, you can, you can talk to the actuators. It's not rocket science, but it is new for our part of the industry where we make actuators and valves. And then you take that a step further and you make what we would call a sensor hub. So you communicate with an actuator, you can command it, you can get feedback, you can get some information about the motor, but you can also connect sensors. So you might be able to put sensors in a location that normally you wouldn't just because of cost, I.O. counts, things like that. And then next step is, well, we can add cloud capabilities to that device. So instead of a field bus connection, you know, it's got an IP connection. So it's got an Ethernet port on it. Maybe it's PoE, maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a standard Ethernet port. And now it has the ability to synchronize its digital twin with our cloud. And we'll talk about cloud in a little bit. And then finally, we have a class of dice, devices we, we refer to as performance devices. And I hope, maybe show of hands, who knows what an energy valve is? I love to see that. So this is, this is our favorite device. This is kind of our flagship device. It takes all of our technology and sticks it into one package. So it's a control valve with communication. It's a, got a flow set, an ultrasonic flow meter. It has two temperature sensors. It has optimization logic in it that um, allows that heat transfer process to work as clean as possible. And then maybe more importantly, um, it gives you data. You know, you get valve position, you get inlet and outlet water temperatures, you get flow rate, you get BTUs. Um, all of that information comes in a nice package. And, and a performance device is intended to kind of drop into a uh, traditional HVAC design. So where there would normally be a pressure and dependent control valve, now you can just take that out and pop an energy valve in and the rest of your your control system doesn't really have to change. It's just kind of a good, better, best kind of solution where that energy valve is the best. And then this is just a point I want to make. So we have this really high-powered platform that lives inside of an actuator. Um, and some of you may say, well, why do we need the digital controller anymore? Let's just take that application logic and stuff it inside of your smart actuator, let us program it, and we'll be able to do all kinds of fun stuff with that. Um, but I'm here to tell you that's not our plan. Um, I wanna make sure we're completely clear on this. This isn't our business, and we honestly wouldn't be successful with it even if we wanted to. We're, again, we're focused. We, fo we focus on making devices. We don't know how to, we wouldn't know how to support a programmable pl software platform even if we wanted to. So that's something we hear in the industry quite a bit as we bring the technology level up of our devices that, you know, Belimo is gonna start selling programmable controllers and it, it's not in the cards and it's not something we aspire to and it's so not gonna happen. All right, so, so as an HVAC device manufacturer, we, you know, we see the eventual future where all devices are connected and they provide as much sensing and control data to the BAS system as possible. We've also invested uh, a lot of money in, in this in a complete digital ecosystem that, that kind of ties together all, all parts of our business to build a digital life cycle for each of our devices. This, this creates uh, new ways for us to enhance uh, user experience um, with our products and also from a product design and ordering in our web shop inst to installation and maintenance tools and even replacement guidance um, using, using an app on a smartphone. Um, so with all this rich device available for our devices, um, there's, there's an opportunity for third parties to use the, the, this data that we collect in our cloud on behalf of the device owners to create value for building owners and operators. And we enable this creation um, of value through an API so you can get at that data and, and build services and software um, based upon that. And we don't charge for that. So if you buy a smart device that has internet connectivity or, or cloud capability, that all, that all comes for free. We store the data for the life of the, uh, of the product. And you know our model is to help drive demand for these new connected devices um, and, and enabling that whole, that whole digital connectedness of our industry. So we have quite a few um, 
industry partners that have developed connectors or plugins or, or service models based upon that, that connection to our data. And another point I want to make from a focus standpoint, we don't plan to do any of that either. So we just want to make devices, we want to make it easy to get to the data, but that whole service model, um, it's not of interest to us. If you can't stick it in a cardboard box and ship it, that's not something we really want to deal with. So, so moving on. So um, back in 1977, we re re released this, this first direct coupled actuator. And then in, um, in 92, we, we transitioned all the motors to these efficient, reliable brushless DC motors with a little microprocessor. Um, so we've been the baseline for actuators for about 40 years now and control valves for about the last two decades. So we're, we're, we're motivated to be that market leader. Um, that direct coupled actuator, that was the, the primary innovation and that's pretty much what everyone does today. And we continue to set the standards for, for reliability, warranties, control signals, efficiency, all the above. Um, once you get into the digital world, um, it gets a little different when you start talking not about mechanical performance standards, but instead communication standards. Um, so starting off, you, you can't we can't sit in a room by ourselves and come up with communication. You know, we do that for mechanical properties, but we can't create new, new uh, revolutionary ways for our devices to communicate. They need to interoperate with other people's equipment. So as everyone here at this show is gonna say, IP is the future. We see all of our uh, devices eventually communicating and we think IP is the only way to do that. Um, that's the only way to do it in a secure way, whether that's wired or wireless or, or 5G, 6G, CBRS, doesn't really matter. Um, but we see that as the future. And then if we shake our, you know, our Belimo Magic 8 ball, uh, there's a couple things that we think will have a, at least in the short term, have a big impact on our industry. Um, BACnet SC is one of them. Um, brings the ability to secure or encrypt a device that's communicating your system. It also brings a bit of controversy. There's plenty of people who would say BACnet SC is kind of big and heavy and heavy-handed, um, and it's not necessary, just adhere to IT standards. Um, but one thing BACnet SC brings is kind of a no like, and trust relationship with um, specifying engineers. So if I'm a specifying engineer and I've been specifying BACnet systems for a long time, and suddenly the owner says, you know what, everything in my building needs to be secure, it's an easy checkbox. Um, and, and for that reason and that reason alone, I think it'll have a big impact on our industry. And, and the second is a, um, maybe not as concrete of, a, of a, an idea or, or path, but we think Thread will have also an impact on our industry, especially in the retrofit market, um, where you can run IP in a wireless way in a mesh network, um, anywhere where you have an existing building of controls and you have you know, miles and miles of uh, RS-485 cabling and you don't want to replace that with Ethernet. Um, one of these wireless technologies is going to catch on, and we think Thread has a good good chance to be that. So this is my, I think my last slide. Um, and unfortunately, there's not any information on here. Um, from a digital standpoint, we have a lot in the works, uh, a lot on our roadmap. And unfortunately, that, that uh, digital world that we live in um, is a intellectual property minefield. And so until things are ready to be released, I can't really talk about them. Um, but what I can say is that we are investing in agility. So when, when you know, BACnet SC is, has, it, has made its market entrance in a, in a big way, a, a lot of adoption, and we need to have a BACnet SC product, we'll be ready to do that in an easy way. When we want a CBRS actuator, we'll be able to implement that, not in 10 years, but in one year. So, we're investing in a platform to be able to be able to take on new technology in a, in a quick way. So that's, that's our perspective on uh, digital products and, and where we're headed. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go through the summary. So well done. Thank you. Well done. So Tom, 
you know, you left the page blank, but come on, Belimo, you always surprise us with something. Come a little, you know, little glimpse. So I can tell you that um, when I first started at Belimo 11 years ago, I heard the phrase, we don't worry about patents, we just out-innovate everybody and let them try and catch us. And things have changed. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I think we are all excited to see what's coming from Belimo in the next couple of years. Yeah, now. as, we are as super am I. Excited, and I think we all agree the direction looks good, right? We love it. Well done, Tom. Thank Thanks. you so much. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it over to questions real quick. Does anybody want to ask Tom a quick question? We got just a minute. We got Mike Runners in the audience. Just raise your hand. You guys are quiet. You letting them off the hook? One up, here. up here, Scott. Over here, I, I hear we got a question in the back. When are you going to POE? POE, Tom. Any thoughts on that about Belimo using POE as a... Uh, yeah, in fact, we have a product with POE in it. Our energy valve, our newest version of our energy valve has POE. So if you want to power that up on a POE switch without sending... 24 volts separately, you are, it's ready to do that. Yeah, I, I often think Belimo misnamed that, the energy valve. It should have been the IP valve, if you ask me. Right. But, <laughs> but no. It's I, not a bad idea. For all of you who didn't know, the energy valve does have Ethernet. It's a BACnet IP device. You can add it right onto an Ethernet network and incorporate it into your control logic through Niagara or however you're running it. So. Uh, so for all you didn't know, we already have an IP-based actuator, FYI, so. Yeah, and as, and as I showed, it went really quick, but Energy Valve is one of our IP-based solutions. We do have just plain old actuators that have an Ethernet connection on them. You can attach a couple sensors. It'll connect to our cloud. You can control it from the cloud if you want to play with that. You can control it over BACnet, um, read sensors from all those different ways, so, yeah. A lot of capabilities already, everybody, so. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, Tom. Well done. Oh, wait. Oh, shoot. Sorry. One more. Glenn, one more question. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Detroit. Um, peers of mine that I've kept up with or tried to for quite a while have been talking about once you get a product like your energy valve, you can do pushed automated fault detection diagnostics and device down to the device level. And that way you don't need the smarts in the head end. You just communicate out, hey, something's wrong with me. Are you guys there yet? To do automated fault detection and diagnostics in, device, inside of a device? At the device level, so it just reports out health. Um, we're not there yet, but that's definitely on the roadmap. Yep. Thank you. We're, uh, it's hard because we're, uh, we're not selling a programmable controller or something that we intend to be updated in the field. So we need to have algorithms that are fully baked and tested. I mentioned we're a Swiss company. So everything is done 10 times. Um, and so it takes us a little while to implement some of those new algorithms into a product that we want it to be in the field for 10, 15 years, running the same software it started with. He said thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Well done. Thanks. Thank you.